Have you ever told, or have you ever been told to tell someone that you're sorry? Oh, go tell them they, you're sorry. Now, the question is, did that make you sorry? No, it didn't make me sorry. I got told that lots of times. It made me sorry I had to go tell someone I was sorry, but it didn't really make me very sorry. Today we're going to look about t- today we're going to look at a Bible theme that is very important and that is the subject of repentance. The subject of repentance. And our first text was our scripture reading it was found in the book of 2 Corinthians, the 7th chapter in the 10th verse. And it says this, For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Well, in this text, we see here clearly that there are two kinds of sorrow. There's worldly sorrow and there's godly sorrow. And we want to take a look at the difference, what the difference could possibly be. First of all, let's notice what repentance is not. Genuine repentance is not feeling sorry that I got in trouble. It's not feeling sorry that I'm condemned. There's a text in the Bible in in Matthew speaking of Judas where it says, then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. A very interesting wording here. It says that he repented himself. And any kind of self-generated repentance isn't worth very much. So the sorrow of the world is being sorry that I'm in trouble, being sorry that I got caught, being sorry that I'm going to look forward to some kind of punishment or judgment, whatever. Apparently this was Judas's brand of sorrow. And I suppose that most of us have experienced some of that too. I can remember back when I was in school, an incident that got me into a little bit of trouble. Uh, I'm going to have to change some of the names to protect the guilty. Um, but it, some of us boys were outside, and some of the girls too, and, and uh, there was a break period, and we were out front on the porch. And uh, one of my friends, we'll call him Bill, he proceeded to take off one of the girl's shoes and run after the school principal who was driving away in the school van. And so he took her shoe and he tossed it on top of the van. thought that was a great thing to do. Now, uh, I happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. I'll just say that right here because I was just, all I was doing was gleefully running along behind him laughing. When a, a, apparently at that moment, my teacher decided it would be a good idea to come out and check on us. Jonathan! Oh, if I close my eyes, I can still hear that, that screeching yell. And as the van rode to the stop, right before he pulled out into the, the street, Bill reluctantly grabbed the shoe from the top of the van, and we headed inside. Now, I don't really know the exact reason my teacher was upset with me, but I was in trouble. And I, the problem was is that I, I didn't, and if I'm being completely honest, still don't, feel that I had really done anything wrong. I was just a witness to the crime, if, as it were. I thought Bill, he was the one that should have gotten in trouble, not me. And I can remember my teacher handing me a misconduct report. Now, a misconduct report, I don't know if you had those in school, but a misconduct report was basically a sheet of paper detailing my crimes. And what I had to do was I had to take that home to my parents, and get them to sign it and then return it to school the next day. Well, I didn't think that was very fair, and so I told my teacher, I said, I'm not going to do that. If you want to give it to my folks, you can do it. I don't believe I did anything wrong, so you give it to my folks. Now, I'll admit, I don't know what I hope to accomplish by her giving it to my folks, but I can tell you that when my mother arrived to pick me up from school and was greeted by my teacher holding that report, I experienced quite a bit of worldly sorrow. (laughs) And even more so when I got home and she told my dad about it. Quite a lot of worldly sorrow indeed. But why was I sorry? Well, I was sorry that I had gotten caught having fun at someone else's expense. 
I was sorry that my teacher decided to make my parents aware of it. Sorry that I had not won the argument with my teacher over the misconduct report. Sorry that my mom hadn't taken my side. Sorry that my dad always took my mom's side. I felt a great deal of worldly sorrow for the scrape that I'd gotten myself into, but I wasn't truly sorry. Let's take a look now at a a Bible premise concerning genuine repentance. Acts chapter 5, verse 31. Acts 5, verse 31. Now, the apostles are making it clear that Jesus had been exalted to give repentance, it says, to give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of of sins. That's the exact word. Those are the actual words. Him God has exalted to his right hand to give repentance to Israel. And Israel includes anyone who's interested in Christ today. So, one of the first things that we notice about genuine repentance is it's a gift. It's a gift. It isn't something that we achieve, it's something that we receive. Now, repentance includes two things. Sorrow for sin and turning away from sin. And it's important for us to remember these two things because if repentance for sin is a gift, then sorrow for sin is a gift and turning away from sin is a gift. And this is crucial. It's even revolutionary because many of us have thought throughout the years that that the way we turn from sin is to to grit our teeth and strengthen our backbone and and our willpower and all the might we had. and, And it's a surprise for many people to actually discover that repentance is a gift, both sorrow for sin and turning from sin. Well, how do you get a gift? I guess most of us are familiar with that. The only thing you can do to get a gift is to accept it, to receive it. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. It would be an insult to the giver of the gift to work for it. You must receive it. And this is where we come into the presence of Jesus, the great gift giver. He's promised to forgive our sins, and that's a gift, but he's also promised to give us repentance. In Romans, the second chapter, in the fourth verse, it tells us another clue. The goodness of God is what leads us to repentance. The goodness of God. Well, we might say that that means he is good to lead us to repentance, but there's a deeper meaning. It's his actual goodness, his kindness, his patience, and his mercy toward us that breaks our hearts and helps us to understand what repentance is all about. And then we begin to understand that repentance, the genuine kind, is being sorry that we not simply broke a law or that we broke a rule, but that we broke a heart the heart of our very best friend. This is where another school experience of mine comes in, only this time I was in college, no longer in grade school. I was probably 20 or 21, and and I'd gotten into some trouble with my professors for doing something I knew to be wrong. There was no arguing with them at this point. In fact, it was serious enough that I needed to call my dad and tell him about it. And as I nervously dialed that phone and and, and waited for the answer, I can remember that sick feeling in my stomach, knowing that I was going to have to come clean, knowing that I'd been raised better, I'd been taught better. And when my father answered, I was nervous and I was shaky and um, I couldn't very well carry on a normal conversation. I had to get right down to it and, and it was all I could do to get my confession out. And I was scared of what he was going to say. I was scared he was going to be angry with me. But you know, his his response was so loving, so kind, so understanding that it broke my heart. And the tears began to flow, and I, I began to experience true sorrow for what I had done. Not because I was in trouble, that part was over with, but because I'd brought disappointment to my father because I'd hurt his heart, someone who loved me and had always done the best for me. There's a famous poem by John Greenleaf Whittier, and maybe you learned in school, I remember having to learn it, and 
Apparently the poet was reminiscing one day back to his childhood and he remembered a spelling match, a spelling bee, and a little girl that had outspelled him. And, he, and she felt sorry for doing that and later she became his wife and then she died. And Whittier wrote this poem entitled, In School Days. Still sits the schoolhouse by the road, a ragged beggar sleeping. Around it still the sumacs grow and blackberry vines are creeping. Within, the master's desk is seen, deep scarred by raps official. The warping floor, the battered night seats, the jackknife's carved initial. The charcoal frescoes on its wall, its door's worn sill betraying, the feet that creeping slow to school went storming out to playing. Long years ago, a winter sun shone over it at setting, lit up its western window panes and low eaves icy fretting. It touched the tangled golden curls and brown eyes full of grieving of one who still her steps delayed when all the school were leaving. For near her stood the little boy, her childish favor singled, his cap pulled low upon his face where pride and shame were mingled. Pushing with restless feet the snow to right and left, he lingered as restlessly her tiny hands the blue-checked apron fingered. He saw her lift her eyes, he felt the soft hands light caressing, and heard the tremble of her voice as if a fault confessing. I'm sorry that I spelt the word. I hate to go above you because the brown eyes lower fell, because you see, I love you. Still memory to a gray-haired man, that sweet child's face is showing. Dear girl, the grasses on her grave have 40 years been growing. He lived to learn in life's hard school how few who pass above him lament their triumph and his loss like her because they love him. Why was she sorry that she spelled the word? Because she didn't want to hurt him. Because she loved him. And that experience in my university dorm room talking on the phone to my dad taught me what true repentance was all about. Now the Bible makes it very clear, very clear indeed who the people are. The people are who need repentance and the people who appreciate repentance are the ones who are sick. Those who realize that they are sinners. That's why we'd like to notice a very significant text here in Matthew, the ninth chapter, Matthew chapter 9. Jesus said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Go and learn what that means. Now when Jesus tells us to go and learn what something means, it must be important. And then he said the following words, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Well, apparently then, Jesus is trying to tell us that, that sinners, those who are sick, can come to him, the great physician, just as they are. And they are the only ones that will come to him. People who aren't sick don't need a doctor. People who think they are righteous think they don't need the Lord. But people who realize they're sick and the people who realize that they're sinners are the ones who realize their need of a Savior. And the Savior stands with outstretched arms, inviting everyone to come. Come for what? Come for his love. Come for his acceptance. Come for the gifts that he has to offer, the gifts of forgiveness and repentance. That's the only way we get it. And this leads us to a very important fact and many people have un misunderstood this, whether it's the, at the beginning of our Christian life or, or every other day along the way. We are invited to come to Jesus just as we are. Just as we are. Makes no difference who we are, where we are, what we've done. The only way we can come is just as we are. We don't fix up our lives in order to get to Christ. We come as we are, and He changes our lives. That's exciting news. That's good news. That's the gospel, folks. If we had to change our lives in order to get to Christ, in order to get Him to accept us, well, then we'd be like the man who had a, a car with a horn that wouldn't work. It was in the dead of winter. It was in the middle of a blizzard, and 
And he decided he better go downtown and get his horn fixed. And so he drove downtown, he went to the garage, and, and out front of the garage there was a sign out front that said, Honk for service. <laughs> well, he was in big trouble because if you have to honk for service and your honker doesn't work, it's going to be a long, cold winter. Well, if we have to change our lives in order to get Christ to accept us, it's going to be a long, hard winter. And this is one of the greatest truths of the entire gospel, folks, that Jesus loves to have us come to him just as we are. And 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says it. It says, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now Peter, Peter, he knew what he was talking about. Maybe that's why he said it. He knew what it was like to experience genuine sorrow. But first, let me tell you, about the stories shared about the worst spanking a young Norwegian boy ever got. Now, the way he tells it is like this. He came over from the old country, from Norway, and, and the philosophy was pretty simple back then. Spare the rod, spoil the child, right? So, and it started off with something small, like a rolled-up newspaper, and, and it didn't even hurt. In fact, one time after getting spanked, the young boy went to his mother with a big old grin on his face and said, that didn't even hurt. Well, that was the worst thing he could have said because... She told his father, and then he made sure it hurt. But the worst spanking that he ever received, the way he tells it, was the time his father never even touched him. They'd gone vacationing at this campground at this beautiful lake, and, and there were boats and swimming, pretty much anything a young boy could ask for. But he and his brother were doing their usual thing, fighting. They were ruining the vacation for each other, ruining the vacation for their parents, and their father tried everything he knew. He tried taking away their dessert. He tried taking away their supper. He even tried solitary confinement in the cabin. But nothing worked. And finally, the, the boy recalls seeing his father at the end of his rope, on the edge of the bed there in the cabin, trying to talk with him, trying to reason with them. And then he ran out of words. He ran out of ideas. And the tears began to flow. Now, this was unusual. They weren't used to seeing their strong father cry. But on this particular day, that was the hardest thing he ever took. He could take the newspaper, he could take the switch, but he couldn't take that. His father, who had done so much for him, in tears because of him. And he wanted to change. He really wanted to change. And he did change. Maybe that's why some people call genuine Repentance, being sorry enough to quit. Sorry enough to quit doing what we're doing. And this is what transforms people's lives. It's what Peter experienced. Peter had been a faithful disciple, but he had many ups and downs. Nothing would take him away from the side of Jesus until that night in Gethsemane. When the mob came and they pushed and shoved their way to Jesus and they pushed and shoved him all the way to Pilate's judgment hall. But before they did, they did that, the disciples, they left on a hundred yard dash trying to get away, trying to save their own skin. And Peter was among them. But then Peter slowed down and he began to think about Jesus. And he couldn't bear to be separated from him, so, so he found his way back to the hall of Caiaphas and, and where they'd first taken Jesus. And there he stayed around a fire with people trying to get warm, and he tried to listen to what was going on. And he saw as Jesus was rudely jostled and pushed around, he saw them put that hood over his head and hit his face and say, prophesy unto us, you prophet, who was it that hit you? He saw them take the hood off and, and slap and spit in his face. He saw the crown of thorns, and his heart was broken. And then someone said to him, hey, aren't you, aren't you one of his disciples? And he got nervous. And he denied it. But they continued to press him. Yeah, you even talk like one of them. And they continued until Peter, with cursing and swearing, denied that he even knew Jesus. And just at that moment, when the rooster crowed, Jesus' eyes and Peter's eyes met. Now, in Jesus' eyes was not a look of resentment or anger, but a look of pity for his poor disciple and of disappointment. 
Peter couldn't take his eyes away from Jesus, and as he looked into his eyes, a flood of memories came back to Peter. He remembered the time by the sea when Jesus came and said, Come, follow me. And he had left his nets, he left everything he had, and he followed Jesus. He remembered the time in the temple with the hassle over, over the tax, and he'd gotten himself into trouble, and then Jesus had gotten him out of that trouble. He remembered that time out on the lake that one night when, when he thought he could walk on the water like Jesus could, and, but his pride just about did him in, and, and he almost drowned. But Jesus lifted him up, and Jesus had saved him. He thought about just a few hours before when when Jesus had said to him, the devil would like to have you that he might sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you. I have prayed for you that your faith not fail. And as these memories came back to Peter, he couldn't take it any longer. He realized that he had in fact struck the hardest blow at Jesus that night. He turned. He broke away from the gathering there at that fire and he, he went out through the gate of Caiaphas' courtyard and, and down the streets of Jerusalem. And then he went through the golden gate and the city wall and he left the city. And he went down the hill across the brook Kidron and up the other side to the garden of Gethsemane. And there he groped around in the darkness until he found the very spot where Jesus had sweat great drops of blood and he fell down on his face at that very spot and he wished that he could die. He really wanted to die because he was sorry, the genuine kind. Sorry that he'd broken the heart of his best friend. Sorry that he'd brought sadness to Jesus. There was another man that wanted to die that night. His name was Judas, and he did die. They found him on the ground after the thin rope that he had hung himself with had broken. He did die. He was sorry too. Sorry that he was in trouble, the worldly kind. And so, friends, we see clearly the difference between these two kinds of sorrow. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, We pray for that gift of repentance. Lord, we know that we have all sinned and fall short of your glory, of your goodness, of your greatness. But Lord, because of you, each one of us stands equal at the foot of the cross. We praise you for that gift of of being sorrow, sorry for our sins and, and that gift of turning away from our sins. Lord, we don't want to hurt you any longer. We love you. We want to make you happy. And we know a way that we can make you happy, Lord, is by by sharing the love that we have found in you with others. Others are, are dying for want of hearing that message. They don't have the hope that we have. They don't have the peace that we have because you are the author of peace, Lord. And so we pray for courage. Lord, as we repent of our sins We also want to repent of our slowness of heart, of our stubbornness to do what we know is right, of our desire to have someone else do the work in our place. Lord, forgive us, for we have sinned. Thank you for the gift of repentance. Thank you for the gift of your love. In your name we pray, amen.